can I, can I just ask if someone can turn the lights out? There's a, the light switch is just is by the door over there. So we can get started. That's it. Thank you. Uh, right, okay. We might as well start. Um, that door as well. I'm going to leave it open just in case some people come a bit late. It's closed. No, we'll leave it open because uh, some people tend to come a little bit late to these uh, presentations. Um, <clears throat> and welcome to all those who've uh, not attended before. I think there's some MA students here. Um, which has been done with arrangements between Grenville and Alex Tardy. Uh, um, <clears throat> what, what we did the last uh, time was to look at the way in which um, traditional values uh, in 19th century art were overturned by um, art gradually being absorbed into uh, motor production. And we looked at the importance of Duchamp in relation to that, Marcel Duchamp. And um, we speculated as to the kinds of uh, challenge to um, the art object that Duchamp posed by exhibiting uh, an object which was a generic object, a functional object, transposed into the institution of art. So that ultimately we looked at Duchamp as a kind of institutional critique and that um, what we evolved from that was that from the, although we, we actually were a little bit, we prevaricated a bit as to whether or not Duchamp was the first to do this, because, because the conditions for it were already being set up by 19th century commerce, um, and the, um, uh, the uh, commodification of culture that took place, particularly in Paris, during the, the latter part of the 19th century. And, um, but we didn't attach any real values to, uh, to what Duchamp did. We were really interested in the way in which Duchamp's work challenged this, the, the aesthetic philosophy of Immanuel Kant. So we used the seminar last uh, two weeks ago to, to firstly to, to look at Duchamp, to explore that a little bit, and to look at some of the things that, that, that the ripples that Duchamp set up, and also to overview certain aspects of Kantian philosophy. Um, and the reason why we looked at uh, Kant was because Kant was the first philosopher to start thinking in terms of modern approaches to the reception of art. It's often a crit critique of Kant that, that makes it that such that Kant did not really discuss the production of art, but he discussed the reception of it. In other words, what do people think or feel when they look at an artwork? What does it mean to look at an artwork? And the one thing that we really came down to, to, to actually nail it with a phrase, was that the important thing for Kant was that you could prove everything in theory. You know, the important thing wasn't the practical aspect. It was what he called transcendental metaphysical aspect of an idea. So, in other words, from that point, we could see that the conditions for possibility of Duchamp were already laid down. Um, and they were laid down by Immanuel Kant, amazingly. But <clears throat> and this week, what I want to do is I'm going to discuss a bit of history, really, um, where art history and world history combine in um, the development of certain uh, procedures and certain practices that don't have anything much in themselves to do with art, but uh, are reliant upon art as a set of values. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, discuss art in relation to the commodity form uh, and the, the way in which the commodity form has evolved into a pure form, a pure financial form, which has involved uh, dealing with um, quantities of art um, as assessed by a market and not by a critic. Um, so so that, that's the, the aim what we're going to be trying to do today. Uh, before, I before I start, I should say that I'm showing quite a few uh, images of works of art and I'm in no way showing these images if to say because they are extremely expensive they are therefore crap. Far from it. What, what we've got here are some of the most extraordinary images ever made um, because there's one thing that we will discover um, that uh, extreme high value is not always associated with tat. 
it's very often associated with extremely transcendent objects. Objects who who create a sort of mythology of their own materiality. Something that I'll look at a little bit later on as we go. Okay, so whenever you think about art and money, uh, in the UK anyway, there is one name that comes to mind. Damien Hurst, right? His latest stock market valuation is something around 3 billion. Uh, and that's down 30% because he's, he's probably lost a bit over Brexit for all I know. But um, Damien Hurst is um, an incredible artist and an incredible businessman. And um, that kind of combination, which they call sort of entrepreneurship, is how I would start any conversation about this particular subject. And um, that Damien Hurst's work in many respects represents a very pure form of finance speculation. Um, now this might seem like I'm starting at the end, which, which, which actually I am, but, but I think that it's a very important point to make. That Damien Hurst's value is, oscillates in relation to the market. It doesn't matter what the critic says about this work. In fact, critics say nothing about this work. Uh, except for one, we will come to later. Um, and, and it's taken as a kind of self-evident given that this work is good but because it is really about having a certain value for people to put a value on in terms of money. Um, and just recently, the, the, this um, woman, Kim Hirston, who's a, an art, um, she's a kind of art broker. She doesn't have a gallery, um, but she has an incredible contacts list, and, and she is um, a, a, a maker, a shaker and a maker in, in the art market. And she said here, um, her clients, as he says, Kim Pearson, whose clients include Naples collector Massimo Lauro, who's a huge Italian collector, very, very good man, said she ha has been scouring for her art, art at fairs and auctions alike. Um, I'm telling anybody who will listen to buy him because Damien Hurst is here to stay, Miss Hirston said. If successful, the efforts that is the efforts of Hirston and her partners could offer a real-time glimpse into the market timing moves of art world elite, where the taste of a few can still sway the opinions of the masses. Oh, that's us. <coughs> We're a Few marketplaces are as changeable as contemporary art. This is a realm where price levels for an artist can be catapulted in a matter of minutes by a handful of collectors in an auction. Those same champions can then turn around the following season and dump their stakes in the same artist, dismissing him as a sellout. And there's even been instances where um, art collectors have done just that, deliberately to suppress the price of an artist's work. As the artist's work drops in price, so they come back into the market and buy more, the price goes up. It's win-win. And, and that process, which is used, that practice rather, which is used in, the, in the Wall Street and the city of London, which I think is called short selling or down selling, I can't remember what. That's quite common now. So in other words, the, 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 the artist is, is somehow someone who oscillates on an index. And depending on where that index is, you might step in and purchase. Okay, so I think there we've established the fact that what goes on out there, not far from here, down the road, um, has this impact on the purchase of art. And of course we all know that art relies, and always has relied, on power, on capital power. Whereas once in the 13th, 14th century, it was the church, by the time we get round to the 19th century, it's the bourgeoisie. Um, it's, it's people who, professional people who make money in various other activities and then decide to buy art for various reasons. The investment aspect of art, as I will show, has only really happened since about 1970 or something like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is a little bit of history. Um, around about 1958, um, the, the 
US government started to put money through various foundations, put money into exporting, for want of a better word, um, the, some of the best products of American art. And, and American art really doesn't arrive until a particular moment, and that particular moment coincides almost at the same time as the end of World War II, um, for various reasons, which I won't go into now. But um, from about the end of World War II, uh, in, in the United States, there emerges um, a certain phenomenon, and, um, which has been given the name Abstract Expressionism. Uh, whether that's absolutely correct or not, I don't know, but that's the, word we're, the two words we'll use. Um, and at first, there was a lot of resistance to it. Um, the, 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 the big collectors shunned it. They were still interested in, 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 in 19th century art. They were still interested in traditional art. But you had all these artists, people like Jackson and Pollock and Mark Rothko, coming up in the early 1950s with these huge, amazing paintings that were transforming aesthetic experience into something that was radically spatial and, and had, uh, had you know, ramifications right across the whole experiential world of how you actually look at art. So the US government, <coughs> realising that what they were looking at was this kind of phenomena of this new art, started to promote it. <coughs> and they, um, through various agencies, including the CIA actually, they started to um, sponsor exhibitions in Europe in particular, uh, in Germany in particular, and um, had put out uh, group shows of abstract expressionist artists. And in fact, there is a sort of version of that on at the moment at the Royal Academy, um, which everyone should see. I mean, I don't know if anybody has seen it yet. I certainly haven't because it's a bit expensive to get in. Um, but I, it, it's a very interesting. Um, a group of artists to, to look at in this historical context. So, around about 58, as I say, they began to promote it. And the reason for that was because, although they didn't understand what was going on with after expressionism, in fact, how much it was related to European expressionism, that comes later, but that it seemed completely original. And it seemed that the artists themselves were real originals. They, they, were, they were very, very special kinds of individuals. Um, you know, you, you, in, in order to do those kind of paintings, you, you had to have extraordinary uh, abilities, uh, especially in relation to colour and scale. And, and that was a completely new kind of experience. And it came out of New York, which was, of course, a very um, a, a great metropolis, uh, a metropolis of, uh, that, that itself functioned like a mountain range in terms of its architecture. It was like being in some sort of sublime environment. Um, but those um, artists, they represented this sort of rugged individualism. You know, they were, they were, they were go-getters, they were very, very powerful people, they, they, they uh, took enormous risks with their art. Their art was dramatic, it was exciting, it was, it was sublime. You know, it, it actually presented us with something that we really didn't know how to make of it. Um, <clears throat> And for, for people working in the, uh, in the agencies which were sponsoring United States uh, politics, particularly their foreign politics, uh, this um, uh, represented the, um, the apex, if you like, of American freedom. And as we know, American freedom is based on <coughs> capital. It's based on the accumulation of private wealth and, and the way in which that wealth is used. So what you had at that particular time was um, something that the, the US government put forward as representing something which contrasted with the opposite, which was Soviet communism. Because, because, because although we would have to say that if you look at the history of Soviet art, um, it, during the period of the uh, high avant-garde in the 1920s and the 30s, the, the, the Soviet system was producing the best art anywhere in the world, um, and the best architecture as well. Um, but by the time we come to the end of World War II, when there's a realignment, sort of these tectonic areas of, uh, of influence, either capitalism, freedom, or Soviet communist repression, you had this kind of dividing line. And what the uh, American art agencies tried to do was to promote the American way of life through their art. 
So at the very, very outset here, you have this kind of situation that, that new art, a radically new art, will be backed by the state as, as a kind of outface or facing out to the world. So, you know, one of the things that I just picked up on was a, a remark by the artist Clifford Still, who's in the Royal Academy exhibition. And he says, yeah, the crate, as the crate of my work landed on the dark side of Bordeaux, the reverberations could be felt all the way to the Kremlin, which I think is quite a nice kind of idea. So that they, they were doing a big show of Africa Expressionism in Paris. Um, I can't remember where it was that they did. did it? it might be the Modern Art Museum. Um, and the work was imported through Bordeaux and taken to Paris for showing. And, and uh, still um, made this comment, you know, that as the crate went down in Bordeaux, <coughs> all the way to the Kremlin, the Kremlin was thinking, Christ, you know, look at this. Look at our horrible socialist realism. You know, people, kind of workers in the factories and the rest of it, and families going like that. And, you know, all the, all the kind of socialist realist art that they were producing, or that they insisted on producing as a kind of expression of their state. The Americans had these kind of individuals, these great artists who painted with colour and scale and, and romance and excitement, um, and made their work look stale and academic, which, which it did. That point, arguing about it, it really did. Um, okay, this is a Jackson and Pollock from 1952. Uh, I've forgotten the title, like the autumn rhythm. Um, but I think that this, I think Pollock is, has to be equated with this phase of American art more than any other artist. And the reason for that is that, that Pollock's work represented a a truly novel expression of art. Um, the sort of art which you, you have to take it as coming from some other kind of consciousness rather than the idea of a traditional picture. So Pollock spreads the canvas out on the ground and he dances around and he makes these, these incredibly these stunning kind of uh, figurations of, uh, of material, like, like looking at someone's nervous system. And, and it's, it's, it's very interesting that this kind of idea of energy, you know, the kind of, um, uh, this, this dynamic um, is uh, very, very unique uh, to, to Pollock. And it is um, something that was picked up on by Clement Greenberg. Um, although Greenberg wasn't really a big fan of Pollock. Uh, Pollock's work was a bit too, uh, too on edge for, for Clement Greenberg. But, but Greenberg had the, had the, the, the writing skills to be able to put this work into a particular type of context, that of a sort of existentialism. You know, that Pollock took the kind of risk of coming to the edge of the abyss of what could you do, what was the limit point that you could, that you could examine, and how, how that reverberated through, um, actually through ancient um, uh, American culture, through, through the um, uh, relationship that it has to sound painting and various other kind of things. Um, anyway, the, the essential point is that the that, uh, United States um, interest in terms of their uh, foreign policy, which means, in a sense, also their economy, um, uh, th this work was, uh, you know, was, was very important. And um, as soon as the, um, uh, the, you know, the, the institutions began to support it in the United States, um, you had the people who owned the production in the United States begin to purchase that work and, and, and add it to their already um, probably fairly extensive collections of European art, which is what they collected before. So you, you had all these people like Rockefeller, um, Andrew Mellon, uh, the Getty, Carnegie, um, and, and offshoots, uh, Gulbenkian, and many, many others. I, 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 I'm not going to, to name them all, and, and in, in a sense also we, if we wanted to, we could discuss the history of this kind of evolution that comes from the certain type of uh, magnet to uh, a more modern kind of uh, businessman, such as Robert Skull. Um, Robert Skull was a, a, a man who owned taxi ranks in New York and became one of the biggest collectors, but at a slightly later date, so I'm looking at the 1950s, first of all. And the, the artists that they, they sought after were the Pollock, Jacuni, Rothko, Klein, and Gorky. 
And, and then, just, just on, on the cusp of that, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, they began to become aware of art, which was, as it were, hot off the studio. Um, most of the collections that they were putting together were of works that had been um, made some time before. The Pollocks from 1940s, for example, were you know, purchased in the 1950s. Whereas, from about 1958, you had the emergence of a new type of art, um, pop, it was called John Rauschenberg, and, and another artist who, who was a bit of a sleeper at the time, Cy Twombly. Um, and they, they, came, they came almost directly from studio into gallery into collection. So the whole process was speeded up around about 1958-1960. And um, from that point onwards, we, we now begin to look at something rather different. I, I should say that I've just started with Damien Hurst. Hurst is a UK-based artist. Um, most of what I'm going to be doing now is looking at American art. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't make any excuses for this. Um, the, the simple reason is that um, American art during the period in question was by far and away the most interesting art um, and in some senses remains so. Um, and the reason for that, I think, that, that it is the way in which the United States has, it doesn't have a heavy tradition to, to, to worry about. It doesn't have to worry about the Renaissance. They don't, they don't have to think about uh, the 18th century. They don't have to worry about the French Revolution, for example. They, they don't even have to take on board the philosophy of Kant. No, no they don't need that. Their, their philosophy is pragmatism. Um, they, they don't, they don't, or economic rationalism, which is way you want to look at it. Um, they, they, don't, they don't get involved in that. But they, there's, a, there's a sort of a, in other words, there's a certain sort of lack of history um, in, in the United States, which was, was, and still is, I believe, very beneficial to, to making new art. There isn't the problem that we have in this country of artists who feel somehow beholden to what has gone before or what a kind of accepted idea of an artwork is. And, and I, 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 although I have a great admiration for you know, artists in, in this country during the 1960s. Uh, I think that they really changed things. They changed the, the game completely, uh, even leading up to people like Wilbur and George. But I still think American art evidences what I'm talking about better be, because there isn't this kind of rather prissy aesthetic idea that, that everything somehow has to be bounded by some kind of a priori institutional approval. And that's borne out, I think, by the fact that there are very, very few jury exhibitions in the United States, whereas there are many in the UK, or maybe there aren't so many anymore, because it's probably people who think they've moved on, we become more like America anyway. Um, but in the United States, they, don't, they didn't have any. They, they, they had them up, up to, to a certain point in the early 20th century. Uh, and one of them, of course, the famous one, the Armoury Show, where Duchamp got his uh, uranium into it. Sorry, not the Armoury Show, but the, the Society of American Artists. And he, he, he was on the committee of that, and he got his own work in by saying that it wasn't his work. But, but the jury had said, no jury, no prizes. Any work that was submitted would be shown. And then Duchamp's urinal came in front of the committee, and, uh, and Duchamp said, we can't show this. We, we can't have this work there. Um, and then, and then, he, then he, he sort of a bit, it was a bit like the Muppets, you know, he, he sort of, he kind of said no, 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 and then he's gradually shifted his position very cleverly to say yes, 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 because if we, if we are true to our word, then we've got to show this as art. And we know the, the rest is history, the urinal was ex exhibited at the, at the American Artists Society show, uh, where it was photographed on the opening night and then thrown away. And because as long as the publicity came out, Duchamp was happy. He didn't want anyone to look at the work. It was nothing. Completely unimportant. It was just a sign. It was a sign that if we say that everything is art, the artist says his art is art, then that's art because an artist has said that you run on his art. Now that attitude actually is, in, is deep in, in American artist culture. 
it, in a sense, if you can put it rather crudely, it's what you can get away with. And, and, and that is a fundamental thing. I think, myself, as an artist, I think it's very different from the way I think. Um, my, my concerns are essentially historic. They are always kind of historic. They're always located around already existing sort of tropes and metaphors. And I think that happens to a lot of people who make art in the UK, and in France, and, in, and in, maybe in Germany as well. But as Europeans, we always have this sort of stretch of time that we're dealing with, that we somehow wish to, to perhaps revisit. So there's the idea of, of repeated histories, and the idea of uh, these deep level philosophical equ uh, equations which emerge from our architecture and from our institutions and from our history that you cannot really throw off. Whereas in the United States, it's very different. It's such a big place. There's so many different kinds of people. There's so many different sort of possibilities. There's, the landscape is just awesome. You know, there's, there's all sorts of things. Anyway, so abstract, uh, American abstract expressionism became highly collectible. And as a result, the prices for it went up. And, and what really happened then, in, this is in the uh, late 1950s and early 1960s, what really happened was that the, uh, the issue of scarcity came to really impact on the market. And the biggest example of that, there were two. Arshila Gorky, who committed suicide in 1955. Jackson Pollock, who died in 1956 in a car smash. Um, in other words, their work had a limited amount of product associated with it. Something like Rothko, on the other hand, continued to produce work. So the result is that Rothko's pricing structure was different to that of Pollock because of scarcity. And as we know from laws of economics, the more scarce a commodity, the price goes up. Or the increased demand for a commodity, the price goes up. Because it becomes more scarce. And that's a fundamental law. Uh, in, in, in actual fact, I'll, I'll just say at that point, that, that, that law was initially really articulated in, in history by Adam Smith, who was the same generation as Kant, who worked out the laws of capital and, and, and mapped the changeover from industrial to mercantile capital, which is what we're dealing with here. Um, we're going to end up with finance capital because there's all these different stages. And all these different stages of capital, they're all discussed by Karl Marx. So if anybody wants to find out about the capitalist economy, read Karl Marx. It's all there. Uh, <coughs> funny that somebody who was deeply opposed to capital, not deeply opposed to capitalism, but was, was, was someone who, who did oppose it, but, but also valued it, was Marx. And he is taken now as the enemy of capital, and he's the person we must turn to if we want to find out where it really works. Because he charted it, he wrote it down, he lifted the lid on what really goes on. Because there's one thing we'll discover about it, and that is mystique. Just incidentally, this morning, anecdotally, uh, there was a, an interview with a, 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 um, a, a journalist who is a training journalist in Australia. And because of Brexit, they're going to have a new trade deal with, with Australia. And, but the details of the trade deal in terms of financial trading will be secret. And her, her way of saying that was, look, your average bus rider in London doesn't need to know what goes on. But we have to get it right. In, in other words, the, there's something in the economy that goes on that is the truth of that economy that we don't know about. But where we can find out a bit about it is through art. And also we can find out about other things too if we read a bit carefully. Um, so, back by Capsule and Crypt and Greenberg, Celebrity descended on these artists, they became overnight cultural icons, and they represented the triumph, not just of American art, but of American values. That's the important point. In other words, they became like icons, uh, very famous, I mean, legendary, um, to the extent that, you know, that, that, that painters, for example, British artists, uh, like Albert Irving, for example, or um, uh, William Scott, um, in, in the 90, late 1950s, they travelled to New York just to go and meet Rothko, 
just to go and sit in Rothko's studio, just to, as it were, almost pay homage at the feet of the of a master. Um, and and that, that was that situation. This was, a, this was definitely a, a, a kind of, yes, it was a triumph. But as we know, despite all the efforts of uh, introducing uh, American abstract expressionism into Europe, the Cold War did not end. In fact, during the 1960s, it intensified, um, reaching the apex of the, what's called the Cuban Missile Crisis, when President Kennedy called the bluff of Khrushchev um, to remove their nuclear warheads from um, Cuba. Um, although they hadn't actually sent any. Um, and it, became, it, was a, it was a major kind of confrontation at that time. And that was, a, that was really the, 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 the top line of the Cold War was then, 1962. Um, at the same time, certain things began to, to, to change. Um, and, and I, I will, I've, I've got this in a little bit too early here. Ronald Reagan decided to free up the US interest in global market economics. I'm slightly out of that since. Um, so can I just stay with this for a minute? What I really want is some art, right? Um, I'm just, I'll go back, but just to look at some of, of the artworks that I think are important during this particular period. There are ones that you, you will know. Um, Jasper John's the, the flag paintings. There are over 88 flag paintings that have been made by John's. This was one of the first ones, 1955. And um, uh, is a is actually a highly complex kind of object. Um, I'll refer to it again in a minute. Um, uh, Andy Warhol, 1963, Silver Disaster, reckoned by many commentators to be the best Warhol ever, um, and sold for. Um, no, it's not. No, those are um, they're, they're silk screens. They're each each image is around about uh, 24 inches by about 36. This is a huge painting. What? And they're different frames. Yeah, no, they 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 squeegee onto the canvas using a silk screen. You get a silk screen off the bench, right? Right. You put it on your canvas. Make sure your canvas is tight. You, and that silk screen has got a photo. It's a photo silk screen. So it's got yeah. basically it's got a dot matrix on it. Right. And you run your squeegee over it with silk screening, and it registers like that. Yeah. But because it's on canvas, some of the registering isn't perfect. You see what I mean? So you have this kind of indexical. Well, what do you mean? Here? The image is a car smash. Yeah, not Pollock's, but but another. Um, it's some car wrapped around a telegraph pole with a couple of bodies in there. It's really gruesome. Um, but Warhol was very interested in spectacle. Did you have to do with Kennedy breaking his pole? No, it's, it's a completely anonymous accident. But, but these, these accidents were, were photographed by the police. And uh, Andy Warhol was very interested in, uh, in this kind of spectacle because he believed, that it was a, he believed that it represented a phase in the commodity, in the development of the commodity. In other words, disasters were commodified. I'll come to that in a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the best Warhols. I think he's great. Um, and it's, it was sold in, uh, I think, in 2011 for, I think it was around $60 million. Yeah. He often had these monochromes and extra panels. He did. He, he read how the numbers yeah. and the ways that I just wanted to make them bigger. This yeah, no, it's... Uh, but they are kind of so powerful. Yeah. The kind of absence of the next to that. Well, I mean, yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant move. Uh, the, the reason why he had the, the monochromes next next to the panels was because he went, went to uh, Ellsworth Kelly's studio, and he saw Ellsworth Kelly painting huge canvases one colour, and Andy said, "Gee, I like that. I want to do that." You know. So he went back to the factory, the, the studio and got Gerard Malanga to get another canvas out, painted it one colour and stuck it next to the, the silk screens. Because not all of the silk screens works do have a panel next to them.
But when they do, wow, that's really good because you have this kind of this void. You know, so, so in a sense, these kind of repetitions of images represent, in a sense, they they they, they are. You know, if if I if I was a Marxist critic, I would love this work. I would think this really shows it, you know. This is like a load of creepy banknotes. And of course, Warhol's done banknotes, he's done Coca Cola bottles, he's done canvas suit, all those kind of things. But, you know, Andy is a, a completely transparent individual. He doesn't have any, he lacks any sort of substance. He's all surface. He's proud of it. He's, he he said, to, said in an interview that he was profoundly shallow. <laughs> Which is a really good idea. But yeah, these are, these are silk screens. Um, on this, this painting is, I'm sorry, I haven't got the size, but it's huge. It's, that, that's over 10 feet, that's about 4 metres across, and about 2 metres, 2.4 metres high. So, so when you see one of these, these are something else, you don't forget them. So it's about 24 foot? Sorry? It's about 24 foot? No, um, 4 metres I think is about 12 feet. And 2.4, I think, is about 9 feet. So it's about 9 by 12. So it's still, it's pretty big. You know, it's a big paint. The silk screens. Yeah, it's, and the silk screens are you know, relatively sort of small frames. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a whole seminar in this. We, we, we could discuss this at, at great length if we wanted to. Because there are, and, and the actual fact, the funny thing is that there's very little written that's really good about Warhol. But most, most of what's written about Warhol tends to talk about his celebrity. Yeah. Uh, when in actual fact, in 1963, Warhol was on the cusp of a really sort of strong avant-garde, you know. Um, but at the time, these works didn't sell for very much at all. In fact, he had a show of them in Paris and sold none. I just want to go back. Hang on. Yeah. I just want to go back. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to come back. I'm not necessarily sorry about this, Pat, but it's crap. Um, I said here, with the emergence of pop, you know, which, which, that's the rather stupid word which describes Warhol and the genres of the action book. Art became more pliable to ideas that were actual uh, part of real world experience. And therefore, the rational. The actual is the rational. So what really is there is, is what we have. What we can't choose is rational. And that then, capitalism. Because the United States was developing at that time uh, almost like a post-industrial economy, but just turning into being changed from the production of objects to the production of images. So, you know, the modes of production that were there in industrial production were repetition and material objects. John's Rauschenberg and Warhol are important. They limit the production of commercial images in celebration of the common, the actual, the real. Uh, the popular and the vernacular. This art did not come about historically. I think this is a this this is a key point. It, it did not flow from Picasso. Uh, this came, dare I say, it, actually this work came out of capitalism. It did not come out of art. It comes from a completely different way of thinking about art. So it did not come about historically in the sense that it followed from Picasso, it just seemed to happen out of itself. And in a phrase, a turn of phrase, ex nihilio, out of nothing. And it's that originary, out of nothing, which is valued very highly in American art. So you can't divorce that out of nothing to mean something, which is its value. Um, I, just want to, I, I think I can, I'll, I'll say this now so I can leave this slide behind. The, the Cold War did, did not end, it, 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 it intensified throughout the 1960s and even the early 1970s, including the, the student revolutions of the late 60s, which were a, a, in actual fact a challenge to the capitalist system. But in 19 75, Ronald Reagan became President of the United States and he inaugurated a new kind of attitude to the American economy which was called deregulation. In other words, all the regulations that 
that withheld the banks from speculating, for example, were lifted. Suddenly, capital floods into the market. If anybody wants to know about this, there is a writer called David Harvey. He's got it all. I'm not going to go through how, why, how, what. But David Harvey, there's books by him in the library. He, he is the best writer on explaining how this deregulation of capital would lead to globalization. Um, so let's put that out of the way. So we've got to take that into account. 1975, Ronald Reagan. It opened up a new chapter in the history of US capitalism, and um, many new kinds of investments occurred in the art in the market, including contemporary art. Um, and the demand for art uh, was was raised up, it was it was increased. Um, um, again, that's a little bit out of sync. Now, I'll talk about postmodernism in a minute. Right, so Warhol, very important. Also important, um, abstract painting, uh, and in particular, Frank Stella. 1962, Frank Stella worked out a, in, in a sense, a, a very, very rational and organised way of painting which was to identify the mark size of a commercial brush with the scale of the painting itself. In, in other words, in contradistinction to European art, which would still insist that composition adapts itself to the picture that you're making, Stella took it the other way around. He turned it on its head. So therefore, when you have a canvas, it's the size of the canvas is determined by the size of the brush, which is then exemplified indexically by going down in these stripes and leaving some raw canvas in between each bar of paint. Mm -hmm. And Stella, really without knowing it, um, established here the kind of apex, if you like, of the logic of abstract expressionism. He identified the fact that painting was flat, and it was made with paint, put on by a brush, and of a particular scale. So the relationship between the size of the brush, which is the three inch, and the size of the canvas was, uh, was synthesized. It was, a, it was a synthetic. It was a new kind of form. And what he established this stuff <coughs> was the absolute conditions, if you like, for painting. Um, and those conditions were baffled the market. When you consider that the market at the time was largely to do with images and largely to do with novelty, you might say that, when Stella's work came to the market in 1963, it didn't do very well because people couldn't understand quite what was meant by this. It required that the, it required an understanding of what's called formalism to sell this work. It had to be explained through opticality. In other words, well look, it looks good. It, it, it shimmers. It looks good. It does something. It, it's not quite like a Matisse or a Picasso, but it's kind of a painting. And it looks good. So therefore it is good. And it took a while before Stella's work hit the mark. <coughs> It was a delayed action, in actual fact, because it would soon hit it, but about ten years later. And there was other abstract painting as well that played a part here. Larry Poon's. <coughs> this, this painting is 1963. Um, I mean, to be quite honest, I could look in vitamin P, you know, the painting book, and, and you don't get anything as good as that. Because Poos, again, like Stella, established the kind of fundamental condition of opticality. What is the thing that we're looking at here? With these little kind of lozenges, like little kind of creatures or, or elements, or more accurately, cones. So in other words, Poos already realised, sorry, um, Larry Poos realised, a bit like Frank Stella, 
the underlying painting was not the image, was not, you know, the vernacular of the everyday that was in your newspaper. It was what produced the newspaper. It was the kind of coding of the machine. So in other words, what, what they were doing, unbeknownst to the critic, was that they were looking at systems. They were looking at how, the, at, at the time, America was in the forefront of systems technology. They wouldn't have been able to send a, a rocket ship to the moon without that. Um, and, and that those systems were being rolled out through various kinds of uh, automated processes, even though they, they were painted by hand. Okay? Um, and I'm not going to labor that, but I think that there is a relationship here between the idea of an automated system and a kind of theory of, of economics in the sense that you can perhaps apply systems and system technology to money. Um, that you can look at the way in which coding operates to make decisions through various machines. At the time that these were being made, there, the machines actually didn't exist for this. Because the first mainframe computer was not was made in 1948 by Norbert Wiener, and uh, the IBM mainframe I think came a bit later, around about 1960. But computers were not actually used for anything other than a, an adaptation for the military to enable more accurate targeting, to enable more complex co um, calculations to be made about where something that you send up in space ends up. They weren't really used economically at that time, but I think that the general idea, if you like, of, of coded work has had some relationship that, we've, that we're now seeing in a, in a very strong way reflected through market economics. Right, the other really important artist from this particular period is Ed Roche. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry that they're all male artists. Um, I think there are other aspects of that come later. But Ed Roche, 1966, the standard gasoline station series, of which he made many of these paintings, uh, that were based on photographs that he had made. Um, and he initially started out as a photographer and shifted to doing these paintings. These are, these are, they're not huge, but they're big paintings. And they, the technique involved is spray paint. It's, 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 he doesn't touch the canvas. It's not, it's not a, there's no touch in this. this is, you know, if, if, it was a, if it was a more efficient way of making it, uh, he, would, he would do it. It's a little bit like Roy Lichtenstein. I haven't got in I should have had him. But um, it, it's, it's about, again, it's about this kind of automation. It's about the technicality of the image. The image is a technical object. It, it's, it's not about looking at the way the sensitivity or the authorship of the artist. It's about looking at the way in which the thing is actually produced. That painting. That, that's a painting. That's a painting. That, that, that's maybe the, I think it's acrylic on canvas. It's quite big actually. That one. I think it's about six foot by around about fifteen feet. So it's a big, it's a big painting. It's Right, yeah, he might have. Yeah. He's still, he's still, yeah, he's still very much around. Still, you know, um, so, so is Frank and Stella and Pooms. They're, they're still around. They still make, make exhibitions. And Stella had a show last year at Bernard Jacobson Gallery. Um, and in, in a sense, Stella is now a person who very much uh, decries the work that he made in the, in the early 60s. He thinks it was very overrated and that. Um, he, he discovered expressionism and um, everything changed. But, but Rouché still occasionally does things like this. Um, and yeah, as you say, yeah, it's, uh, you, you can find him in the, in the galleries. He's, he's a very um, prominent artist. Um, right, another person to look at, uh, I think from the same period, is Cy Twombly. Um, Cy Twombly's work uh, owes a lot, I think, to a reading and understanding of um, a new kind, a different kind of abstraction. And, and it's a bit like that, you know, if we could 
to stretch our imagination a bit, that you look at the stripes of the um, uh, of, of the flag paintings by Johns, and, and uh, or, or that you look at this kind of idea again of code or of of, of uh, um, transcription, and and also the idea that you, you can that these these scribbles may have some sort of meaning, and of course they were stem from uh, Twombly's interest in um, uh, graphic representations and his interest in graffiti, particularly when he spent time in Rome. There was a, a, a lot of graffiti, and it, it was political graffiti or historical graffiti. And the other place he went to was Pompeii. And he, he started to do paintings that were very much about inscriptions. And this particular painting, which is called Cold Street from 1963, it's, it came onto the market last year um, at a Sotheby's auction and it sold for $75 million. Uh, so, so, in other words, the, 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 um, the stock of Twombly is very, very high. And four days before the auction, Twombly died. And the work went through the roof. $75 million. And, and the prices for Twombly's are uh, remain very, very high. He's a key player in the art market. And his gallery is Larry Gugosian. I don't know if anybody has ever heard of Gugosian Gallery. It, it's a, it's a, a, a very big gallery in London. Two big spaces, two huge spaces, one in King's Cross, one in the West End, plus a window in Davies Street. And Gugosian, um, started out as a, as a kind of businessman and shifted to become an art dealer and through a very, very clever kind of uh, set of, uh, how shall we say, um, offers, um, got himself to a preeminent position where he, a lot of the, the most expensive art is sold through Gagosian Gallery and those offers that, that Gagosian offered were taken from the idea of shared adventures. In other words, you take your shares now, pay for them when you made a profit. So in other words, you can, you can buy a work if you've got leverage, if you've got the ability to raise money from the market because you're a trusted source of money, you can go to Larry's uh, Gagosian's gallery and you can say, I fancy that Twombly. Um, okay, no problem, it's yours. You've got the you've got the uh, leverage capital there. You've got you know I, I know in other words my, my bet with you my wager with you is safe because you will be you you will any loan that you take will be will be securitized. So so you don't have to pay me at the moment. You can take the work or leave it in the warehouse whatever you see. But you are the owner, and, and that means that you can after a period of time resell. And sometimes those periods of time for resale are, are tight, you know, one year. You've got to own it for one year, you can resell it. So in other words, if the artist's stock rises in that one year, you can make a profit. And then you can cut Larry in for his bit. So the market operates on the level of, it's not as if people are exchanging lots of dollars. They're exchanging loans. That's how it works. So, so they're, they're, they're not exchanging positive capital, it's what we might call negative Capital. Oh, right. Have you ever to do? No. No, you can't. You, you, can, you, can, you can have a photograph made, obviously, because you need that for publicity, you need it for archiving. But actually, sort of making an engraving of it and, and, and doing what they used to do with old master paintings, you know, making copies and then flogging them on the market, no. Absolutely not. Illegal. Illegal. This, this, this stuff is unique. That's the whole point. There's only one of them. Oh, there's only one of those twombies. Okay, so you might wonder where all this bullshit is coming from. <laughs> um, I'm going to cite my source um, now. Uh, it's a book by the American uh, critic Benjamin H. D. Booker. And I've just reviewed this book for an art magazine and therefore I've, I've sort of read it. Um, and I think it's a great book. It's a very important form of visual research. Um, and it's a, this book called Formalism and Historicity uh, by Benjamin H. D. Buckley. And 
in, in, in certain sections of this book, you, you, you actually encounter really first-rate historical research, such as Russian constructivism, uh, productivism, uh, such as work on the Belgian conceptual artist Marcel Bruders, and on the work of um, other artists. But interspersed with it, you get this thing which he calls historicity. And historicity deals with an understanding of historical moments as moments of production. And very often, with Bouclot, he links those moments to, to fissures or gaps in historical, historical representations, where something occurs that cannot be fully accounted for, because it splits, it represents a break, and in that break, in that break, you can, if you look at it like a kind of genealogist or an archaeologist, you can find out where the mode of production is. And then you look for an artist who also understood it in that way. And that's what Bucklow's method is. So he's looking for these breaks, historicity as he calls it. He's looking for that. Frank Stella is one of the people he writes about. And he called Stella's discovery in 1962 to be the epistemological consciousness of painting. In other words, the full knowledge of painting demonstrated. Brush mark, scale, rationality, order. Bang. That is the fundamental recipe. What is your fundamental recipe? That is the question that, that Bucklow looks for. And when, he, and when he encounters it, he then critically examines it. Sometimes favourably, sometimes not. Um, underlying Bucklow, there is the work of another philosopher, sorry, another philosopher, T.W. Adorno. I'm not going to deal with him at the moment, but I'll just give an example of where Adorno said an epistemological break occurs, and that is Auschwitz. And it's very interesting, I think, that these, very often, these kinds of shattering events are, are represented, are representing these kind of sudden void spaces in history where art is somehow expected to not paper them over, but but to to somehow affect them. If we would take Auschwitz, as has often been said, even by Bucklow himself, then it would be Gerhard Richter, who would be the painter that perhaps tries to understand that historically, uh, just as a certain moment that occurs in the history of Conan that has rolled out as a universal stratagem is found in Frank Stella or in Larry Booms or in Jasper Johns. But the Jasper Johns flags, Bucklow disapproves of those. I've got this sort of little breakdown to the proof of that in a minute. <coughs> right. Bucklow is claiming that this process of gaining the market or of being in the market in this day uh, by, by investment in art meant that art was present to the characteristics of a commodity fetish. That the consumer was there. Absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. The commodity. Everything was based on the commodity. Why is it a fetish? Because a fetish is something which has more power than it really has. The fetish is really a sign. Now, if, if, it's, if it's just a sign, it's pretty empty. You know, as we all know, you know, some people like feathers, some people like shoes. Um, but those objects are not powerful in themselves. But when they are associated with the mystique of a new value, they become fetishized. In other words, you've got to have it. You know, you've got to get your Jasper Johns, you've got to have a Twombly. You, you might not want it, but you've got to have it. The fetish transcends the commodity. So what we have is that art enters into this idea of commodity relations. And that in itself is a new idea. And Karl Marx actually called this, he came up with this first of all, in the mid 19th, 19th century. He called it the immaterial object. That, that, that is an object which doesn't have any material use, 
whatsoever, but has what we call surplus value, surplus or exchange value use, because it became something whose value was way inflated beyond its material or functional worth. In other words, art is perfect. It doesn't, it's not useful for anything, but how can you get it to be so valuable? Desirable. Desirable, absolutely. Yes. Um, now this process, I'm going to introduce a, a, a concept here, uh, which I think is uh, worthwhile knowing. I hope that everyone will bear with me on this one. Uh, this process by which the immaterial object is raised to excessive or surplus value is called reification. You can see it written there. R-E-I-F-I-C-A-T-I-O-N. Reification. And that's um, a term actually that doesn't appear in Karl Marx. It, 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 it appears later. It appears in, the, uh, in, in other writers who sought new kinds of ways of conceptualising Karl Marx's theories. And reification is one of the key ones. That, although nowadays it's not often mentioned in Marx studies, which is a pity, because reification is really interesting. Uh, in, in fact, it's interesting to the point where if I can, I might try this, um, I, I will photograph a text on my iPhone, sorry, on my Samsung. Uh, see? Fetish show what an iPhone really. <laughs> Just <can't>. um, <coughs> Uh, and, and I'll try and get it onto Moodle. And, and in, in there, you'll, it's a little text by David Harvey. It's only a paragraph. And you'll see in there that he thinks that reification should be re-studied. That we should go back to reification. David Harvey has analysed the financial crash of 2008-2009. And what Bookload terms... Bookload has read Harvey, of course. But what Bookload terms advanced conditions of reification. Now, those advanced conditions we're going to come to in a minute, but that's what really is setting up now. So, reification is the process by which money is taken as a form and through which it turns, this is the key bit, feelings, sentiments into commodities. In other words, simple words, just, oh, love, oh, happy, oh, now. Please, yes, turn it into a commodity, mythologise it, give it this lustre, this gloss, make it absolutely necessary to have, even though it's got no reality whatsoever, other than being a little sign which is picked out of the ether. So reification is a very important concept. If you don't take anything else away from this talk today, Check out Bookload, check out David Harvey, and check out the term reification. Very important. This is the cover of the book. Uh, it's not in the library. Sorry about that. It's on my shelf at home. And they've only got one copy. I will, I will get it back next week, I promise. But uh, Because I, I, I had to buy it for the university to write the review for it. And then the university have paid for it, but I've still got it. Um, so, um, and when the review comes out, I'll let everybody know so they can read it. Um, but it's, uh, that's the book. It's got a, um, that work on the cover, I think, is a, uh, a Lissitzky. And there's an essay on Lissitzky in it. Models and me Methods in 20th Century Art. It's, it's, a, really, it's a really good book, and, it, and it's written in such a way if you're not very confident with theory, you can still read it, because he, he really explains a lot of uh, very interesting things in it. And I was going to read a quote from it, but I've left the book, left my quote in the uh, office, so I can't read that quote, which is a pity because it sets up the um, the rest of it. Um, I'll have to paraphrase the quote. Um, Right. Plus, <clears throat> reification is the process by which signs are reduced to mythologized objects. That's something up. I'm going to try and explain it. Stars and stripes. This is this is how it how, how reification could work. Okay. Stars and stripes. 
the flag of the United States of America, it's the primary sign, it's the utterance. When you see the flag, United States of America, Donald Trump, make America great. America, 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 the flag. Then, stage two, representation of the flag as a design. Many designers and people have looked at that flag as, a, as, a, as an object. And, and it's, a, it's a very beautiful object in some respects. And, and it's, it's been used in commercial property. It can be used in commercial property. You can put an American flag on anything you like. Um, it's, not, it's not copyrighted. Um, now, now, then we have this. Painting of the flag as flag object, as pop art painting by artist Jasper Johns. This is the third one. This is the one that's going to be read for. Right, tertiary model, self-conscious sighting of universally understood symbol. Right? In other words, it goes like Duchamp. The flag is seen something like a ready-made, but it's not a ready-made, it's a painting. But is it a painting? It's going right across the surface. It's an optical object. It's not a picture. It's, it's a facsimile, it's a kind of copy. And it's made, it's got surface, it's got paint. <clears throat> Universally understood symbol, right. Can I just add something? Yes. Um, I thought also that those paintings were also about the quoting of the paint marks um, as a critique of abstract expression. They were. Abstract expression, yeah. and the mark being the signifier um, yeah. of a certain you know, aspect. The yeah. Of, uh, um, a giver of media as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good point. That, that, there, 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 that is one of the internal logics of, that, of, of the reason for that painting. And of course, he used uh, that process of um, uh, encaustic to, to sort of heighten it. But yes, you're quite right. And of course, lots of people have analysed those paintings by looking at the, at the, the newspaper collaging underneath, uh, which was contemporary newspapers to the making of each work. So in a sense, they become archives. So that's a, that's a very good, interesting point. Yeah, no, I mean, as I say, uh, this is a great painting, I think, John's. It's, it's a really good point. Anyway, so let's just finish off the process of verification here. Right, so we've got the tertiary objects. It's the flag by Jasper John's. Then we go to legendary status attached to the flag. Flag, 1955 by Jasper John's. That work now, ha ha it, it's something special. It's got, it's got commodity. It's got real commodity this thing. Flag, 1955, assumes a role of an immensely powerful object. Flag, 1955, is sold 11th of November 2014 for $36 million. By, bought by a private collector. Right. Who they think might be this guy from Naples. No, no, the, often the collectors, the owners, never ever come forward. They don't need to because their work, often the works in the collections is never shown. It stays locked in the vault of the gallery or at the bank. It's just owned. It's a, a counter, <coughs> an asset. So if someone's got the flag, 1955, it's an asset, you purchased it for £36 million. Pounds. Dollars. It's probably worth a lot more now. Uh, oh yes, absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's all sorts of... Uh, I think they call them various defaults. Yeah, you can, you, you can, yeah. And that's one of the things with Gary, Larry Gagosian, why he's been investigated by the IRS a few times. But nothing ever sticks. Because <laughs> nobody knows where it is. <laughs> nobody knows who owns what. You know, it's, it's very clever. Anyway, so that's it. Now, now that, that, that painting, great as it is, has is, is is, is transferred itself into a monetary asset. It can be traded. I can get leverage on that. I own that. A bit like my house, you know. If I if I go to the bank, so I want to borrow, my house is worth three hundred fifty thousand. I can borrow on that. And the same is with, with the flag. So whoever owns it, it can, can trade that, can trade on that, can, can get leverage, can, can raise cash, can raise cash and buy other work. Uh, even more, even more Johns. Maybe then the price drops a bit, can buy even more, and then it goes up again. Verification thus ensures the object as culturally significant, powerful, in terms of the institutions it is asked to represent. Those institutions are not always galleries. These art institutions are themselves financed by capitalist institutions, foundations, funds, collections, and all the other 
systems that surround the art market. A whole lot, including the person who we started out talking about, the, uh, the lady who runs the uh, art consultancy. So, we can sum this up a little bit. Deregulated finance was able to influence which art was shown where. Collections were started, funds endowed, and top business figures became cultural figures also. In other words, you've got a big collection, you write a title to the board of a museum, where you can uh, make your own collection available for exhibitions, or that you can suggest a certain artist that you're interested in perhaps leveraging. You know, so we're going to look at one such artist right at the end. By well, leveraging, I mean you can promote, and then you can quietly acquire some of their work, and then you can see that work displayed on the museum walls. You can short-circuit ratification, if you like. You can do it in two steps rather than three. And the market is very keen on letting you do that. Um, so, yeah, all right. Collections were starting to fund our work. Art acted to fig leaf business practice and polish the company brand. Those appointed to the boards and museums were often collectors in their own right. Right, conflict of interest? Never. This is about the love of great art. That's what we often say. You know, and, and you can't say, no, you don't love art, you hate it, you asshole. You can't say that. You, you, have, you have to go along with it. It's a bit like if ever you meet someone who's a cultural figure, like Nick Sirota, very nice guy, but he always loves art. How can you like Howard Hodgkin and Donald Judd? Sorry, <laughs> never mind, <coughs> completely different artists. <coughs> right, sorry, I'm losing my voice, I've got about 10 minutes. Um, <clears throat> artists and galleries had now begun to perform strongly in market speak. We're, we're in present day now, I've, I've come up to date. They are still performing strongly despite the economic crisis of 2009. Um, in the light of the availability of new money, which we know isn't real money, it's a different sort of money, it's never real money. Dealers, especially in the United States and Germany, that still are the two most advanced economies, and the two richest, um, could now accumulate vast amounts of profit on speculative art, by cheap, so expensive. Not only that, but the postmodern ethos, so I tried to mention this earlier on, but the postmodern ethos associated with the new museums of modern art began to ally with what was going on in the private art market. In postmodernity, you have a new kind of idea, which is that art is smart. Art is a quotation. Art is a sort of game. It's a language game. It's like um, appropriation, reappropriation, disappropriation. Various levels of different sorts of meanings, which to a cognoscenti makes sense, but to the average punter just look like a red square on a wall. But to a collector, it means something else. It means reification. Not only that, but oh no, sorry, I'm repeating myself. Often the same consultants work both spheres with the same artists. They worked through promotional um, and agent agencies and, and um, galleries and, and museums, a whole lot, but they have the same artists, as it were, on their books. The difference between high finance and art has become, had become increasingly hazy, and this pro process, sorry about this terrible writing, um, and this process has advanced accordingly. Art is fashion, and the market depends on confidence, and confidence in art continues unabated. Right, now, what we're going to do was read from Bookloy's book. Well, I haven't got the book, I haven't got the photocopy I made this morning. But in, in the book, and I think the only chapter that really should be read by everybody, is the introduction. Um, even though Bookloy admits that he is an extremely unpleasant man, and very paranoid, um, uh, 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 and, and often is vilified for his Marxism. Um, he, he really, he, he's written this chapter, it's called Introduction to the Introduction. 
And in there, there are a number of paragraphs in which he excoriates certain artists. And by that excoriate, I mean he really criticises them. And there is one section I was going to read out, and he lists some artists who are particularly vile <laughs> in, in his view because they are simply gaming the market in their own value. <clears throat> and I've got some slides of their work. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so I couldn't do the quote, what a pity. Because I like doing quotes because then you don't have to think about what you're saying. <laughs> just read it. <coughs> like Michael Freed, just read it. <laughs> okay, Jeff Jones. He's, he's top of the close hate list. Um, in my opinion, rather unfairly, I think Coombs is a fantastic artist. Um, and this is one of my favourite Coombs works. It's called J.B. Turner Train from 1988. And it's a scale model of a, a, an image that was used in a logo by Jim Bean Whiskey Company. And he approached Jim Bean and said, I've got this idea to make a drinking set and, and a, a, essentially a kind of flask that holds whiskey uh, in stainless steel and exhibit it as an artwork. And Jim Bean thought this was a great idea, so they put some money into this project. It was extremely expensive. Obviously, to make it's an addition of about 150. I think we've all side. I'll tell you a little bit in a minute about that. Um, and what you get is this object. It's around about uh, six to eight feet in length, um, and it's about so high. Uh, and everything comes off. All these little um, objects are little drinking cups, and you unscrew them, and then you you there's a little sort of tap at the back of it, and you drain a little bit of Jim Beam out there and drink it. And these were launched as Jeff Coombs' work in the sets of a highly selected limited edition that were retailing at around about, I think it was about $45,000, $50,000 each when I put them out in 1988. And one of them recently sold or I think it's about $88 million. So, not a bad investment if you purchase one. Because, again, they're rare. They're a limited edition. There's only 20 of them in existence. And all the moulds were destroyed. They will never be made again. Each one is licensed. And uh, you get a kind of certificate of ownership. But many of them have never been seen. They just go straight into vaults, and of course Jim Beam have got one themselves. So Jeff Coons is top of the top list. Um, there's one in the, do you know what, we did today in Hearst, you gathered, and... Uh, no, I, I have been there, but I haven't seen the so Coons shop. He, yeah, he only exhibits. Yeah. yeah, they have one. one there. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to see. I've seen one a few more. Is it? Yeah, I, 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 I did see one at the, in the Saatchi collection. So Damien Alexander's had one of the pictures. He's got the yeah. Old, yeah, he probably does. It's all it's her personal collections of artworks. Yeah. And at the moment he's got all these coons artworks. Yeah. It's a fantastic yeah. gallery. Yeah. Yeah. That, his gallery is brilliant. And he's, apparently Damien's stock went up 30% when that gallery opened. Yeah. So it was a big statement about real estate. It's an incredibly nice building. He won a prize as well for the architect. Uh, I, I actually saw one of those in, in the Saatchi collection when the Saatchi had a gallery in Banbury Road up in uh, North London in St John's Wood. And he gave Coombs a show where he had the vacuum cleaners and he had that. This is about 1992-93. And, and one of them was in there and it was an extraordinary object. Absolutely amazing object. Talk about fetish. But Coombs, he's come from the market trade. Yes, he has. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks for his business to make an art. So he yeah. has since. Well, he is complete shyster and wonderful, but, um, you know, kind of, I was just playing the game. Yeah, yeah, no, he, he, did, he did a few trades and, and made a lot of money, and, and, but purely to make the art. 
you know, because he's been bankrupt a few times as well. When, when he, he started hanging around with this Italian model, um, Cicciolina, this porn actress, and, and he nearly went bankrupt over that. He's, he's, you know, his rate went down. But, but yeah, you're quite right. He was a trader. He worked for Morgan Stanley or one of the banks. And he, he made his first works, he, they, he financed them through trades. So he was spending seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars on just one particular piece, which in 1983-84 was quite a lot of money to put into an artwork, more than Pollock ever did. You know, so so um, yeah, Coombs was, was was in it. He is he is a banker. He is a banker, definitely. Um, and this is a this is I, I'm not sure where this is. Uh, is, it, is it Damien Hurst? Is it right? Uh, this this is a, one of the Bone Dogs, which is his biggest selling line. And uh, one of these was, was recently purchased for 100 million by a collector, I think, in Japan. Or maybe even China. I'm not sure where, but they're going to put it on display in a shop. Yeah, weird. So, so you, you go into a shop and you say, that's there. It's a bit like the Saatchi Gallery, in, you know, where you go into the shop, you see little models of all the artworks you've just seen. So, so, so the, 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 that's good that you see more people in the shop. I've seen more people that I know in, in Saatchi's shop than actually walking around the gallery. You know, because people are in there buying cars and everything. So, so the, this is one, one of the ones obviously that they made first times. Right, the next one is Takeshi Murakami. Villain number two on the bookcase hit list. <laughs> How about this? Golden bear. Solid gold. It's made of Solid gold cast. You know. um, and Murakami, Japanese artist. Extremely successful. Huge interest in his work in the Far East. Works sell for many, many millions of, um, of, of dollars. <laughs> um, yeah, Golden bear, Takeshi Murakami. I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> Really done. Except that it's, it looks like it's complete crap, to be honest. I mean, it, 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 it's, uh, I guess it's cute. Yeah, it's cute. So, you know, it's cute. Yeah, everybody wants one. You know, normally you just peel them and there's chocolate underneath. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> but this one's got real gold. Uh, this is a Mur typical Murakami. He produces hundreds of these um, horrible paintings. Uh, and I, and I, say, I say that reservedly. You know, quite frankly, if a student of mine was doing work like this, I would be over the moon. But because this is so commercial, you know, it's this is entrepreneurially brilliant. This, this is, a, in a sense, something to aspire to. But it's such a clever illusion, you know, he's worked it all out. It's it's like like the yeah, no, you're right. It is. If this, 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 this is, this, this, in a sense, is national culture. Yes, yes. But, you know, because Japanese kids maybe understand this in a different way to what we do. Yeah. Um, and, and it may be this, this figure, you know, this head, this, it, this is a code. Then we'll be back with Frank Stella, you know, this, this is sort of the encoding of a, of a cultural system. So, so in fact, in fact Bopo is wrong to condemn Murakami, because Murakami is a truly art, true artist of historicity. He understands the fundamental DNA code of Japan. That's it. It's this flower head. Yeah, why not? Murakami, yeah, what an artist. <coughs> right. And when I think about Murakami, when you go and look, start looking at his image, you've got to watch it because some of them are difficult to download. You start, you try to download it and suddenly something else comes up and it's another Murakami and then you Another one, another one. And it's like it goes choo, choo. at the end of your session on the internet trying to download a Murakami. You close your eyes, you've got Murakami's in there. You go to bed at night thinking about Murakami's flower heads. It's horrendous, you know what I mean? Of course, the capitalists are onto this. This is just what they want. You know, this, this is it. This is the new sign. This is it. You show someone this and they go into, they go into overload. It's a bit like we're all automator now, you know. You see that form of how to behave. It's a bit like DNA coding, it's exactly the same. Right, talking about DNA coding, Damien Hurst, these are the, one of the these, these I think are really clever as well. 
um, the, these colour spots. Because your eye can't, can't rest in the painting. It's the complete opposite of a Matisse, even though the colours are sort of the same. It's like a decoded, it's, sorry, it's like a coded Matisse or Picasso. It, it, it's all in there. It, so again, Bucklow's wrong, you know, there's historicity in this. This, this is the, this is the, <coughs> the moment when, when, when finance capitalism realised that negative values could be made into positive investments through what they call collateralised default obligations. So if you buy a load of debt, and it's securitised debt, because when the American uh, economy tanked in 2009, the banks securitised all their bad debts and packaged them into various kinds of investments, which you never open, you must open, it's like an attachment, it's like a, it's like a worm. Um, it's, it's a virus. Uh, you mustn't open them, but sell them off. So these collateralised default obligations, and, and, and initially people made billions on them, and then everyone realised that they were empty. And when they realised they were empty because everything was just toxic, boom, the market tanked. So I think Damien, I think he's got to get some credit. And also, you think back to 2009, we think of Lehman Brothers. The collapse of one of the most famous banks in the world, one of the richest banks, it went from having trillions in its accounts to zilch in about six hours because it had got too many of these collateralized default obligations and the whole staff would turf out the offices. Remember all the pictures of people carrying cardboard boxes with their lunch in them? You know. Lehman Brothers went down the day before David Hurst did an auction of his work at Sotheby's and made something nigh on, I think, about 500 million pounds. He auctioned off his work a day later the market crashed. That's clever. So how did he, did he know? Did he know something about what the market was doing? Does, does Damien have this kind of, you know, this uncanny ability to read the market? Is his work really about this kind of coding? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's that's the sort of that was the beginning of Brit Art in 1992, and, and David Hurst was the key figure behind that. He put on their first exhibition, in which all artists who are still now very famous, um, people like Sarah Lucas and others, were in that were in that show. Yeah. yeah. It's a good book called Lucky Times. The, uh, yeah. <laughs> good title. <laughs> What was it called again? Nothing. Oh right, Hunt. Yeah. It's interesting. One of us. A little bit of really or Yeah. I, good. I, you just reminded me of something there when I was talking about Kant the other the other week. I didn't want to tell everyone, but Kant's name in German is pronounced Kunt. Yeah. Emmanuel <laughs> Kunt. I'm doing this here. I'm going to have to be stopping because I know. Something's got a flat because he's doing the thing that Coons is doing, he's just got this completely empty vessel. But he's 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 not stupid, he's doing he is doing something else with them because he he underwrites them in the sense of the traditional way by, by the fact that they're all named after the names of drugs and things. Absolutely. He's yeah. doing a very traditional making actually, a very traditional painting. Yes, he is, yes. And he says he's a traditional artist. Um, he proved it in an exhibition at the uh, at the Wallace collection. We painted these little skulls. It was one of the most extraordinary, awful exhibitions I've ever seen. Yeah. But, but yeah, you're right. And, he, and if you look at his, his websites and everything, you see these drawings, and you think, oh, someone's done a drawing of Damien. You open it up, it's in. He's done a self-portrait in pencil, sort of all the highlights and rubbing out and everything like that. He's done that outside his gallery and he says, I am fancy, but he's hidden. <laughs> and uh, in his coffee uh, shop in his gallery, and he's like a chemist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, no, he's, he, he, he's looking at these and the booms and then Marilyn Flames looking at the Rick Fair, Rick's color charts. Yeah. Remaking these. I don't know. No, I think that's an incredibly, that's an incredibly important point, Alexis. I think, I think because, because I think what we're looking at is, in, in, I remember when I got my first computer, you know, um, I don't remember what it was, an Ensign or some crap like that. And, and, I, and it was really difficult to operate. 
you have to know all about the busing system, and you have to sort of like do all sorts of different bits of programming to make it work, and everything like that, and you've often got a black screen with green writing on it, and numbers going up, and, and all this, and you go, oh shit, what's happened now? You know, I remember taking it back to the shop about three times to get the guy to sort of decode it, because I couldn't, couldn't figure it out. What's happened is that everything has become easy. You know, so, so in, a, in actual fact, when we, when we look at Silicon Valley and we look at Apple, what they've done is that they've made everything super easy. Now it's great. It's all pre-programmed. Right? Pre-programmed, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm doing it. Yeah, you know, uh, all these things are pre-programmed, even Facebook is pre-programmed. It's my identities there, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Who am I? Look at myself, what the fuck am I doing there? And then, then you get this. Now, this is, where, where is Larry, Larry Poons' work? Was actually genuine coding. It was really thinking about a, a sort of level of conceptual coding. This, I agree, it's compositionally intelligent. It's very intelligent. It's intelligible. It's user friendly. It's very good. But it's essentially easy. It's, it's designed for where we are now. And that's why, whenever you see one, you say, oh, recognize it immediately and sort of enjoy it. You know, I like the way it sort of affects the retina. It's, Good. Okay, the, the, the next artist on the <coughs> book host hit list is Richard Prince. Um, and R Richard Prince is, he, he, he shows in the UK, he, he exhibits in a gallery called Sadie Coles. It's in, no, it, no it's not, no that's Maureen Paley, that's interim. Sadie's gallery is in, uh, is it? Beak Street, or near Beak Street? Kingley Street, yeah. Liberties. Yeah, near Liberties, around the back of Liberties. Highly recommend it. What a gallery. It, it's a fantastic place to go. And Sadie Coles is a great is individual, you know. Yes, it is near Golden Square. Where there's, where there's uh, Marion Goodman. <coughs> and Chief, yeah, yeah. And, and um, Richard Prince shows with Sadie Coles. And, and this is what he does. Um, and Booklow hates this work. He, he, he thinks it's facile, he thinks it's sexist, he thinks it's reactionary, he thinks it's conservative, he thinks it's holding up values that Booklow claims to be ultimately immoral values. And, um, and yet, you know, I mean, to be honest, I quite like it because I quite like cars like that. I don't like the painting on it, but I quite like that car, the sculpture. And I think it's very clever the way he puts Bob Dylan in there. You know, so, so you get this kind of... Iconic. Iconic, yeah, it's kind of playing with certain icons. I don't know what the, that, that piece on the back wall is, it just looks decorative. But at the same time, it sort of functions architecturally. And this is a, <coughs> this is a, a, a super new gallery in Germany called the Kunsthalle Brigenz. I don't know where Brigenz is, but this place is something else. Um, it's the whole sort of gallery system is built for Richard Prince. He comes in, he drives his work in, he gets out of the car, he goes back to his hotel, he sits there and counts the money. Um, what nationality is he? American. Again, you know, there's lots of different work. There's loads of different things that Richard Prince does, but this is the thing which I've, I've found, it's, it's, I think it's his most recent museum show, 2014, Kunsthaus Brigades. And then I'm going to end <coughs> with, I'm going to do a little bit of speculation here. I'm going to put my money on Sterling Ruby. Right? Now, I checked out Sterling's prices, and there is no price given for Sterling Ruby's work at the moment, but he is huge. He, he, is, he is the up-and-coming American artist and he plays the game so brilliantly. Um, now, this work here, which looks like a kind of Anselm Kiefer that's been kind of dragged through some dead body or something, um, is a sculpture that Ruby has made, but he, everything in Ruby is, is soaked in paint. Literally soaked in it. Or he works with fabrics which are sewn together and these huge kind of wall hangings 
Drips. Sorry? Drips. 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 As you'll see in a minute. But sterling, it hasn't yet come to auction. So, so we don't really know what the true value of his work is. But it's only a matter of time. Um, so I would say, in fact, I quite like this work. I, I, I think I would probably buy that uh, and stick it in my uh, private collection near Brigance or something like that, because I'll be living there by then. Um, and lauded it over the art world. You know, and I might even sort of trade that uh, in a couple of years and, and see if we can get a better price on it. Um, because Sterling's got a lot of work, and some of it is absolutely enormous. You want to check him out online. It's absolutely incredible. And also, he's just had his new collection of clothes out as well. Um, the, these objects that you see here, these kind of um, sausage things with the American flag on it, I thought that was a sort of interesting take on, um, uh, you know, either Ralph Lauren meets, uh, you know, Johns. Uh, or or it, it's something about soft furnishings anyway. And, and then, because he chucks a lot of paint around, he gets paint all over his clothes. It hit him that he could sell his actual painting clothes, which he does. And he just had a show at um, Scrooge Majors in the West End of London, which was just his painting kits, overalls, hanging up against the wall. Shows the sell out, sell everything. But, so therefore, what he's done now is that he's moved into actual fashion production with an American fashion uh, house, and I can't remember their name, but they're, they're making this stuff for him and, and marketing it, he's designing it. So there you go, we come full circle. Well, it's with the uh, campaign, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, it is, it's, it's uh, it, you know, it, yeah. And, and, and we can only sit back and wait for Sterling Ruby to, uh, you know, to sort of like cut the mustard, as it were. So um, that's all I've got to say about this. I think I think we've kind of I've, I've just said something that we know already. I think it's just completely self-evident what I'm talking about. But I've just tried to sort of give it a little bit of historical context, and also to introduce people to the concept of reification and the existence of Benjamin H. D. Bucklow's amazing book, which, when it's back in the library, um, please take a look at it. <coughs> his, his other his earlier version. Of essays is in the library and often you come across Bookload in other publications. He writes a lot. He's a, he's a really famous writer. Um, and I think there's a big book that we might even have in the office called what's it, 20th Century Art. It's a, it's a book that he's authored with Rosalind Krauss and a few other people. So if there are any questions. Can the deification be applied to absolutely any object? Yes. Uh, the massive Yes. Did you see it in the West End, in, in, in Parkland Square, the cars or crowd, yeah. you know, yeah. jump, jump sort of pristine in the room? Yeah, so, yeah. So yes. Crazy. You can you can you can reify anything. If you can't reify it, it's it's not even in existence. You know, I mean, we can, we could even there's a guy at the moment. He's uh, he's Whoa. doing a series of shows around Britain. His name's Brian Cox. He's a, he's, a, apparently he's a nuclear physicist. He's, a, he's actually not bad. You know, some of the things he says are quite speculative. He's all right. But he is reifying space. He's turning space into something which has some sort of spiritual destiny for us all. Pluto is the new thing by, by Brian as a, a sort of object of desire. And he has these big sort of presentations. You know, he's, here we are in space. You know, where are we? What's time? You get to use this phrase, time space, all the time. What is time space? You know, he, he apparently got asked that from the, the question to one of his shows. He didn't know what it was. He thought, well, time space is, um, well, it's time and space uh, joined together. Time is space. Oh, space is time as well. Yeah, okay, you're right. I never really went none the wiser, you know, instead of actually thinking, hang on a minute, what about Einstein? He invented it. Time space. That's it. Einstein. Yes. I mean, I think we've got to be a little bit sort of uh, uh, wary about that particular dumbing down phrase because 
Um, I would have liked to put myself in a situation where, I, where, where I'm sort of accusing someone else of being dumb. Um, I think it's a little bit unethical. But uh, maybe dumbing down is wrong, but I think that the, the lending everything to facility, making everything slightly faster, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a process of that. And I think that the biggest form of reification now is celebrity. I, I think that, that, that celebrities are raved by it. You know, <clears throat> the best example I've just spotted today in the paper is Lily Allen. Because, I mean, you know, Lily Allen, you know, she's really important, maybe, but she's, she's got some sort of hell of a media presence. And she went to, apparently went to the Calais camp, which is also now being raided, right? And um, she sort of burst into tears and apologised for all this horror that we've inflicted on the world. You know? and, and she's everywhere. And, and, I, and I was thinking, you know, I could tweet something. Because I, 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 I think it's disgraceful what goes on in the Cali camp. And I, I thought, ooh, should I tweet something about this? I mean, I've got about 10 followers, you know. But I could tweet. And I thought, why bother? Lily Allen's done it. Yeah. You know, and Lily Allen's got 34,000 followers or more, you know, on Twitter. So when she puts a tweet out, is it gets in the papers. Yeah, she apologised for all of them. She did. I mean, that's a little bit cheeky. Isn't it? I mean, it's like we're not all to blame. You know, many of us went on the demonstrations. You know, we didn't want the war in Iraq and stuff like that. Now we're being blamed for the Cali camp. Hey, hang on a minute. Put the blame where it belongs. But it's also ironic that we're sitting here, um, so you do in an art school, talking about, you know, expanding our ideas and what have you. And yet, the, the Coombs and Hearst interview on it's a news a few months ago was just hysterical because they were like a couple of. So a Zen specialist talking absolutely nothing. Yes. You know, you have to sit there and say nothing because there's nothing that could be said. Because in a sense what they're doing is so vacuous yeah. um, that you can't say anything because the object is so rarefied that there's nothing there. Absolutely. It becomes it becomes an empty space, a void. And when, and when many of these uh, sort of art historians of, the, of people like Buckler who have studied, well, maybe not Buckler so much, but some of the others who have studied psychoanalysis, they say, well, hang on a minute, all representations are collapsing in the middle. You know, there is a void. You cannot complete a, rep complete a, rep a representation because you cannot represent yourself as yourself without seeing yourself as an object and you can't see yourself as an object. So therefore, in a sense, you're completely compromised by what you look at you can never actually resolve it. So therefore, in a sense, the void is absolutely right. That's what they're doing. They're, they're creating an, an enormous void. Which we rush in and fill it. I think people like Christian Mark are making interesting work which challenges that void. Yeah, I agree. When everything is totally connected and the fourth language, you can't escape it. You can find it yeah. in my use of language. But I think that research like that is that it is connected and there's no escape. So you understand every point of reference. Yeah, no, I agree totally. It's very, very well put. On the positive, it is sort of like um, anything that is nothing. Um, that, that's a bit, that some people have come across that where everything is nothing. That's a little bit like existentialism. Um, that's a little bit like, uh, like Hegel. You know, like a German philosopher Hegel, everything is nothing. Um, the real is, doesn't exist. Nothing exists. I mean, you know, reality is not what you think it is. Like Jeff with John's white flag. Yeah, white flag. Yeah, the white hat. You know, the idea of, of, of the white. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that is good. It's Ray Simons that is collaborating with Jeff Jones. It's the designer, Ray Simons. Yeah, that, that's him, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. He's working with Sterling Ruby, so, you know, watch this space. It'll soon be in your local gap. Or uni No, sorry. <laughs> You're doing well, I my shopping. <laughs> okay, so we're, that's it, really. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. The DA students, good to see you, Rock Dot students and MA students in here as well. I'll hang back and want to talk DA wise about the attempting practice show if there are any other questions. And next week, I think we've got. Tim, Alan and Sharon, we've got third years presenting, is that right? Next Thursday? No? Oh, there is, that's, that's going on. Alright, thanks very much. Pleasure.